Good morning. It's fairly early morning here on September 20th, 2021. I'll show you the sun. You can see the golden light kind of over there against the horizon, but it hasn't come up over the edge of the mountains. It's getting pretty close, though. I'm enjoying the pumpkins that William raised out here. And I wanted to share something. Um, I had just a great week. I've started back to classes down at BYU. Uh, I'm working on finishing my degree in psychology. And I have a cognition class this semester. It's really fascinating. I love to study neuroscience. I love to understand how the brain works um, and why people do what they do based on the experiences that they have and um, and how their brain works, like what's happening inside the biology of the brain. Um, sometimes we, we look at people's actions, right? And we're quick to assign um, good or bad uh, judgments to what they do without fully understanding what's happening inside the physiological body that they are living life with, you know? Um, and we don't always make room for what's happening inside the mind. So this week we studied perception, sensation and perception, um, particularly like what we see, what we hear. Um, the, so the visual and auditory were, were big ones that we studied. And we studied in particular how we see what actually has to happen in order for your mind to perceive the visual stimulus that your eye takes in. And it's absolutely fascinating because I found a lot of correlations between what we studied in the class and what I know of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I was younger, my dad had this habit of turning everything into a parable. Uh, it didn't matter what it was. Oh, I got to show you. Sun's come up now. It's just a little bit brighter, a little more golden. So my dad would, he'd look at musk thistle. I, he used to call it the parable of the musk thistle. We had, we had it growing everywhere on our farm back in Missouri. And he would talk about the parable of the musk thistle. I'll have to tell that one sometime. Um, and anything that, that could be turned into a gospel lesson typically was. So I find myself doing that a lot. And as I was studying the cognitive neuroscience of vision, how we see, I was so struck by what an allegory it is for our spiritual vision, what we see spiritually. So there's four steps. Essentially, there's four steps to good vision, to being able to see something and being able to clearly interpret what you see, uh, and in, which is called perception, into something that you understand, right? So the very first step in vision is to direct your sight, your eyes, towards what you want to look at. It's, it's focusing in on what you want to see. And this seems like a kind of a no-brainer, right? It's like, oh, if you want to see something, you have to look at it. But it's actually an essential step. There are a lot of times in life where we want to see something, but we don't focus in on it. We want to see wealth, but we don't focus on wealth. We want to see marital happiness, but we don't focus on our marriage. We want to have, uh, we want to see our children be happy, but we don't focus in on what their needs are. And sometimes we do focus, but we don't clearly see them. And that's actually kind of the next step. In order to see clearly, you have to seek light. We've all walked out in the middle of the night and you see shadows, but you don't actually see clear shapes. You don't see, um, you don't see color. You don't see all of the, the things that are out in the night. That's because there's no light. We actually require light focused clearly on the retina in order to see things. The reason we have to have them, uh, we have to have the light is there's different kinds of, of cells in the eye. There's cones and rods, and you've probably heard about this before multiple times. <clears throat> cones see color 
and they need light in order to see the color. Rods make up shapes, uh, and they're better for seeing at night, uh, which is another allegory. Hold to the rod, right? <laughs> um, but you have to have light in your life in order to see what you've focused on. So you have to look in the right place and you have to seek the light. After that, after you've sought the light and you've been focusing on something you want to see, your mind goes through this process of transforming what the visual stimulus into a usable pattern of neural activity. So all of these shapes and things that you've brought in, the stimulus you've brought in, are broken down into a, an electrical, electrical um, stimulus that travels through the neuron to the brain. Um, and, and it travels in patterns, much the same way that a computer does. How you see images on your computer, but it's all, it's all uh, you know, ones and zeros, right? It's just created into a pattern that produces an image. Our brain essentially does the same thing. You focus on when you, what you want to see, add light, and then turn it into a useful physical pattern. Essentially, you have to do something with it. Something physical has to happen with the stimulus in order for you to perceive what is out there. You have to do something. You have to act. There has to be an action on the stimulus received. In the brain, it's neural activity. And then something really, really interesting happens. Once all of that neural activity transmits back to the brain itself, the brain has to repattern what it has seen, the stimulus, into something of meaning. And the brain fills in the gaps. So like if you see half of an image, your brain actually will fill in the other half of the image so that you know what you're looking at. And quite often it does this. It, it perceives these things based on what it has perceived before. In essence, we see things so that we can perceive them, but we perceive what we have already seen. We build our perceptions by what we regularly look at. So if you're regularly looking at something beautiful, like um, a beautiful countryside, a beautiful garden, flowers, you're actually going to be able to perceive the beauty more because you're focusing on it. What you choose to focus on determines what you see. My husband loves to hunt. Um, we actually feel like it's important as family, as a family to be responsible for the animals this way, where human beings have moved into uh, to a lot of um, areas where we've pushed the apex predators out. It's actually the responsibility of the humans in the area to help manage the herds. It's why, you know, the Division of Wildlife Services in most states sell hunting tags is because they're managing the herds. And if the hunters don't, um, don't harvest enough animals, quite often the, the park, the rangers will have to go out and kill a certain number of animals in order to manage the herds properly because we don't have as many apex predators. <clears throat> So my husband hunts and a couple of my kids hunt pretty regularly and he can go out in the woods on the mountain and he will see deer before I even know there's anything there because he has been looking so long. He has focused on that skill and so he'll be out and it just looks like sagebrush to me. <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't see anything. He says, no, there's a deer right there. Look, look right there. You can see it. So I'm looking, I'm like looking, I'm literally looking at the same place he has. And I wear glasses, so I probably have even better vision than he does. And I can't see it. I can't see it because it's not something that I focus on regularly. What we look at regularly determines what we see. In fact, we have these special neurons, these um, cortical modules. It's a grouping of neurons that literally becomes specialized in our brain based on what we look at. So if you're someone who is continually trying to determine color, for instance, uh, if you do decorating or painting and you need to see a certain um, set of colors, the more you look, depending on your physical capacity with cones and rods, 
<clears throat> the better able you are to distinguish the differences between colors. There is some individual capacity there, which is also really fascinating to me. Some people simply see better than other people do. Anyway, I really believe, as I was studying this, that it was such a beautiful, a beautiful representation of a couple of different scriptures. We're told in the scriptures to have our eye single to the glory of God. What a beautiful metaphor the eye actually is for how to focus in on God. Actually focus on him. If we want to see him, if we want to see his hand in all things, first we have to focus on him. We have to be looking for God. And second, we have to add in light. How do you find the light of Christ? I actually believe that the light of Christ is in everyone. I believe that we learn to find it by looking for it. Not, not just by someone's actions, but by our own actions of learning to see the divine, the beautiful, the amazing, and the gift that each person is in our life. Even the people who are difficult. <laughs> Sometimes, actually, honestly, especially the people who are difficult. Because they ask of us a higher way of thinking and being. And then we have to take that light and that focus. And we have to create an actual pattern in our life that helps us to perceive truth more clearly. What does a pattern look like? It looks like obedience. It looks like habits and practices that bring us closer to compassion to kindness. It's prayer. It's scripture study. It's service. It's doing the things that Christ taught in his life. Being kind to people, even when they don't deserve it. Being forgiving of others because we all make mistakes. That's a pretty amazing pattern. And then as we, as we follow that pattern, the pattern actually increases our capacity to see God more. In essence, we find what we focus on. We find what we look for. What are we looking for in this life? There's this beautiful scripture in Alma chapter 5 verse 14, where this ancient prophet asks, have you received his image in your countenance? Have we spiritually been born of God? I think one of the most important things we can do with our vision, particularly our God vision, is to seek to be like him, to seek to see the world the way he does. Because he was so compassionate. He was so, comp so, so compassionate and kind. He looked at people and he didn't see the sum of their mistakes. He saw their endless possibilities. He looked at people who were struggling or sinful, which is 100% of us. And he saw the opportunity for growth. Not the compilation of all of their compromised goals and all of their unmet obligations. If we want to see a better world, if we want to bring our vision of peace into focus. We have to learn to see better, to see people better. We need to learn to look at another person's perspective and maybe understand a little bit better where they're coming from. What does the world look like from where they are? Are they focusing on something differently than you, not because they don't believe what you believe, but because they literally are standing somewhere where they see something that you don't see. And maybe if you're seeing something that they can't, maybe we could just share it with love and compassion and kindness. I think it's powerful to think of life in terms of focusing in on what we want to see. 
seeking the light so that we understand it more clearly. Patterning our life in such a way that we can see more easily. And practicing seeing that vision so often that we can pick it out. We can pick God out of someone who's angry. Someone who doesn't look like us. Someone who doesn't worship like us. But our vision is so clear that we can look at that individual and see God right there in their eyes too. Thanks.